Hello, everybody. Are you there? Are you awake after lunch? Yes. No. Somebody's awake over there. What about the rest? Yes. Good. Are you awake, panelists? Almost there. Almost there. Okay. Good. Welcome to our panel here today. Uh, that's me. Yes. What I'm doing is connecting the dots, connecting people. It means we're working with some of these logos down there on innovation strategy, go to market, and thought leadership. And I'm excited to be your moderator here for this session with these gentlemen here. Let's set the scene. Good old times, swimming in money, everything was easy, do not a lot and the money just keeps on flowing in. But I said good old times, we're not there anymore. We live in a cost of living crisis and our customers, the viewers, have less money in their, power, in their purse and more than ever options to watch. At the same time, these guys are fighting. Streaming wars, platform wars, OS wars. So for the consumers, it's fragmentation. It's getting tougher to find something to watch that they really want. And that means churn is ever increasing. So there's a nice study of that's US data of what a customer is planning to do in the next couple of months. And you see only 7% say, I stay where I am. There's a few said, I will have less and stick to those. But the majority says, I have no loyalty at all. So that's what we are going to explore in our panel here with three fantastic speakers. How do I tackle churn? How do I tackle retention? And get out of this circle and keep my subscribers because winning them is really expensive. So we have three presentations and, uh, of the speakers and I will introduce them. Thank you for advancing that. Uh, just to set the scene, Damien says, focus on subscription retention and predict churn. Igor says, increase satisfaction through quality. And Martin said, offer flexibility and don't frustrate your customers by bad UX. So big applause for Damien who goes first and enjoy the session. Damien, come up. My clicker? Okay, fantastic. Um, so thank you guys, first of all, uh, for joining me here, and I hope you're having a great IBC. Uh, Andy has asked me to come up here and tell you all the subscription business is finished. Uh, he told me it would be good for engagement, uh, but I don't know. I know security keeps a low profile here, but I think that might get a reaction. Um, no, it's uh, it, great to get a break from the, the boot for a while, although my, my head of marketing is watching, so I guess I better not uh, relax too much. Um, just to explain a little bit about who we are. So uh, Kling is a, a subscriber management company we specialize in subscriber retention management we have clients from right across the spectrum so from pure sports providers like uh, the NFL the NHL the World Rally Championship to uh, broadcast groups so like the Sinclair broadcast group in the US Optus in Australia uh, B in media in, in Qatar and into really niche providers like Broadway HD which is a Broadway musicals platform uh, and the weather channel which uh, in my home country of Ireland is very popular of course um, so our focus uh, uh, above all else is on um, driving the subscriber intelligence, driving the relationship that our clients have with, with their customers. Our origins were in a live pay-per-view, uh, which everybody at IBC tells me is harder than subscriptions, so I'm delighted to learn subscriptions is a, a simple business. Uh, our, our CEO, Gio, was ex-Apple, so maybe that's why he decided to start us in the, in the tougher side of the business. Um, but our evolution has gone from a live pay-per-view into the subscription space over the last six or seven years. And, and it was very evident to us as we moved into this space that churn and retention was really going to be a key topic. And it was going to be the thing that everybody was thinking about. And for us, that meant to move into churn IQ, which is our, our analytics space, and into machine learning and predictive modeling. But, but maybe I can touch on that later. 
the claim mission, in essence, is about boosting ARPU for our clients, right? Boosting average revenue per user and boosting lifetime value. And our belief and our philosophy is that the main way to do that is building long-term relationships with customers. We do that through our core subscriber management system, our subscriber intelligence platform, our customer support solution, and also our payments management. The reason why we see ARPU and lifetime value is really the key things to optimize is that these ultimately drive every other decision. They will drive changes in subscription pricing, they will drive feature investment, and ultimately, and on the topic we're discussing here, they will drive the decision around what is the right monetization model for the business, whether subscriptions is really going to work for your platform, or whether advertising, whether fast, is going to be a better direction. A little bit on the, the world view of Kling. Uh, this is uh, pretty much what has been the view of Kling for uh, as long as I've been at the company. I've been at the company for over five years. And, and I think that uh, this is the evolution that we see as we work with companies from all of these different spaces. Um, I think it's very important to say that uh, we all still have televisions, uh, so television has not gone away. Um, but I think what we're seeing is that these things on the left, these more traditional ways of engaging with content, are coming back, but in a very different present, right? And this is what this fast channel topic, which everybody's talking about, I think represents. Uh, it's the re-emergence of a lot of traditional ways of engaging with content, but in this totally new context. And I think it's clear to everybody that while subscription as a business is going to have to be complemented by other models, going back to the days of purely transactional engagement with content it is not likely to happen. And so this move towards hybridization to us is still really summed up by this focus on subscriber retention management, whether that is on a content level or whether that's on a subscription level. Um, for Kling, we see the key to this as being this perfect synergy, and perfect is a, is a tough thing to achieve, of course, between your operational platform and between your analytics platform. Um, what that means in practice is that as any new features and any new components of your platform are implemented, you're at all times thinking about what is the analytic complement to this. So I claim that means that if we are developing new sorts of discounting, new types of incentives that you can develop for your clients, we're also thinking about how you're going to be easily able to see what's the lifetime payoff of those campaigns, what do customers do after these uh, discounts and these incentivized periods end. And we feel this is really the key to optimization. It's this back and forth. And I think in reality what happens a lot is that people in data science and analytics are chasing what the operational platform is doing and people in the operational platform are trying to deliver on ambitious aims for analytics. So these are among the topics that I hope we can get into. Uh, just to mention that this is what we affectionately call in Kling as the wheel, and this is how we understand the process of really building a term retention, uh, a term management system, and building great retention. I think what we're going to talk about here is how this context, how the analytical context is going to change in, uh, in the years to come, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. So uh, I'll hand over to, to you again, Andy. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. And coming up next, we have Igor with his presentation. No slides, but even more energy, of course, in return. Big applause for Igor. I don't need that. Yes, you're right. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, no slides for Igor. Uh, really, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about Bitmovin. Uh, I'm chief architect for Bitmovin. Um, in my role, I'm in the field. I'm working with our customers and partners uh, all day long, every day, and uh, I get to hear about all their problems, which I love because my favorite is to help solve those problems. I have this, it's a, it's a weird itch. I just, I have to help people solve their problems. Um, and so, uh, what, Bitmovin, a little bit about Bitmovin. We are a tooling provider for developers, for builders. If uh, you're building apps, if you're building streaming services, uh, or if you're you know, building platforms, also uh, uh, streaming platforms, uh, OVPs, we have a tool set for you to help process content, uh, to help measure user engagement uh, with your content, to help measure uh, users' engagement with ads uh, within your content, um, and also playback, and also content processing. And so uh, these are tools. They're tools that you uh, integrate into your services, but they're best of breed tools. Um, and, and what I mean by that is uh, we're an Austrian company, and if anyone knows Austrian people and German people, they're perfectionists, right? They, they love to make things great. They love to uh, increase quality and, and focus on output. 
Um, and so we've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, we started our business 10 years ago, um, actually coming out of a university program on adaptive streaming, right? Streaming over the internet when it was kind of early in its heyday. Uh, and our co-founders uh, are actually co-creators of the Dash streaming standard. Who's heard of Dash? Anyone? Dash? HLS? Techie things? Um, uh, Dash is one of two um, uh, major streaming standards out on the internet. So if you're watching streaming video over the internet, odds are, uh, if it's not an Apple device, it's probably a Dash stream. And if it's an Apple device, it's probably an HLS stream. And there's some uh, things in between. And the reason I talk about that is because uh, as part of creating uh, the, the streaming standard from the ground up, um, our founders realized, hey, this is, um, you know, this is early, early days, right? Uh, it's one thing to create a standard. It's a different thing to implement software that's actually uh, uh, getting that standard and, um, and putting it into uh, real users' hands. Um, and so after creating uh, a, our encoding software for processing this content and making sure that we're getting great quality with the fewest number of bits, um, we moved on to a player. And we actually created the player really to validate that our streams were working, that uh, uh, we created something that was viewable, uh, by an audience, and it was uh, pleasant to watch. And so for that reason, uh, we created this player, and then we said, hey, this player is kind of useful. Uh, probably there are uh, customers out there who need a video player. There's open source players, there's native players out there that you implement into your apps, um, but it's really hard to manage so many players. You have uh, 40 different platforms, each one with their own quirks, and so uh, we made this player available to the market. Um, and then a few years later, uh, we, we created a solution to help us measure the quality of experience uh, from streams playing on this player. Um, and that's our analytics solution. And we released that to the market as well. Uh, so again, we're, we're developers who build tools for ourselves and then make those tools available to the market at large because they're useful. Um, and, and so why am I talking about these tools in the context of churn, churn management? Um, well, uh, Andy said, what was my quote? Increase satisfaction through quality. Increase satisfaction through quality. Quality, I think, is really at the heart uh, of user satisfaction. And you know, to, to Andy's point, um, right, we're no longer swimming in money. People aren't just subscribing to streaming services willy-nilly. And they're making um, decisions about their discretionary spend. Right? They're not just uh, keeping their services forever and ever uh, because we don't have infinite money. Um, and so then they make choices. Well, which service do I cut? Usually I make that choice as a consumer based on content first, right? But then also satisfaction. Uh, what is my user experience like? Am I getting buffering? Uh, how long does it take for my video to start after I hit play? Um, uh, how do I engage with ads, right? The, does the video stutter when I switch from main content to ad in an ad engagement model? And so all of those, to me, are satisfaction uh, uh, metrics right? from a user's perspective. And the more of those little uh, sort of paper cuts I get as I'm consuming content, as I'm interacting uh, with that experience, the more likely I am to go away, right? to find a service that maybe is better. Um, who's had trouble with their streaming service, any streaming service? You don't need to call them out. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, and, and you think in this day and age, right, there's lots of uh, internet bandwidth available um, and uh, in most regions of the world, right, that's not true for all regions of the world. In some regions of the world, uh, internet bandwidth is very limited and you have to make really smart decisions about, uh, right, which bit rates you deliver to your viewers so that uh, you can make it count. Um, and so uh, that's what our tools do. They help you to understand your viewers' experience um, so that you can make adjustments to that experience so that you can improve it and through satisfaction, increase retention. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. And last but not least, we have Martin. For those who came to see Martin DJ, I'm sorry to disappoint you. He is a fantastic DJ, but not now. Maybe tonight. Maybe I learned. OK, come up. Big applause for Martin. Thank you, Andy.
Um, I think I want to start with, is my mic on? Yeah, it is on. So uh, my sister, who's not working in the media industry, saw the title of the session. It said, churn ma uh, management and retention in a mixed monetization uh, world. What does it actually mean? So that was actually a really good question. So I said, how we look at it, how do you keep your viewers happy so that they don't go elsewhere? And that's what I will bring to this discussion uh, today. Um, as we are at uh, IBC, I want to start with audiovisual media because that represents what we do as a company. So with that out of the way, I hope this gives a little bit of an uh, impression what we do. We are a, tech, a technical company. We are an AI startup based in Amsterdam, so this is our hometown. And basically we specialize in using artificial intelligence to get a better understanding of what the content is that a lot of our customers have to improve the viewing experiences. What we basically do, we, get, we analyze content using a lot of different uh, AI models and we try to create actionable data that help our customers improve viewing experiences to reduce search time, to uh, have accurate start and stop times, to create better advertising uh, possibilities. And we do this for all content and important, we do it in real time. We analyze content in real time because a lot of our customers have live TV and then catch up replay. We want to provide the value as soon as possible. So that's basically what we do. And with this technology, with this toolbox, we basically uh, help uh, improve the user experience across the entire user journey that people have, your viewers have when they are working or using your platform. It starts with making a selection. What do I want to watch? Where often people see generic thumbnails, which does not really help them figure out what content is about or which content to select. It's about uh, when you play content, which is from a broadcast, it often does not have the correct start and stop time, which, which causes frustration because people don't see the program start where they expect it to be. So we correct the program start time. We make sure that people can find topics they are interested in, uh, especially with live content, with news, with sports. People cannot find uh, those topics because the metadata just isn't there. We make sure that people can find that content and consume in novel ways. And uh, lastly, and I think that relates also to a lot of what we see at IBC, uh, broadcast uses really long uh, ad breaks, like five, six minutes ad, ad breaks, which do not translate well for on-demand viewing. So we want to be able to offer f flexibility what you do with advertising, such that also if people watch content on demand, they have a better experience at it. I want to show one example what we do with a Dutch client. It's a video that's from NLZ, which is a Dutch OTT uh, aggregator from different broadcasters, where we uh, did for certain live programming detect the topics in news programming and sports programming and actuality, identify where a, pro where a topic would start and stop, and try to give a descriptive title so that we can actually help the viewer to, to understand, do I want to watch this or do I want to skip it? In this video, it's Dutch, but I used Google Translate to, to uh, translate it to English. But it allows uh, NLZ and also other customers to reuse long form content in short form. So people are able to only watch the parts they care about and also be able to discover that content uh, while well before they couldn't. And I think another example, and this also relates to this session about churn management, is that we see with one of our customers that introduced uh, EPG correction for catch up and replay to make sure the recordings have a correct start and stop time it significantly reduced the number of complaints they get on their help desk. So they had about 1,000 phone calls a month related to people complaining that recordings didn't have to start or stop of their program, or they missed the end, for instance, for a match. They missed the final moments of a match. 
By introducing our solution, it significantly reduced the number of complaints they had and increased the NPS. And I think that's really uh, important for helping in, in uh, reducing churn. Uh, these are some of our customers. So we work with a lot of players that have content from different broadcasters. And that's also what we bring in. We can unify a solution across all the different content sources. And that really helps our customers. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Stay up. Take a seat and Igor, Damien, come join us wherever. Just I'm, I oh, sit you're here. There. Okay. That's mine. <laughs> Good. Subscription is dead, right? That's what you said. It's all over, Andy. All over. Uh, you told me to now stay let's it. let's start with the new kid on the block. Not that new anymore. Fast channels, right? I read on LinkedIn. If I wanted, or we could launch a fast channel in six weeks, is that the end of subscription? Is it a complement to subscription? How do you see fast channels and their impact? Let's just go around the table and maybe Martin, what's your view? I, I think it's for, for how we look at it, I think that viewers want choice and they want flexibility. So some people like to watch content without ads. Uh, some people are willing to, to watch programming that has ads. So I think fast is an uh, additional form of watching content, uh, watching great content. And it uh, suits for certain needs, but it's definitely not uh, fast will solve everything. So it's a combination. It's an addition to uh, subscription, whether it's uh, uh, the operator based subscription or just uh, asphalt uh, subscription. OK, Damien. I think um, fast uh, is not unfamiliar to those of us of a certain uh, vintage, I guess. We're, we're very familiar with that type of viewing experience. It takes away the pain of choice. You just kind of get this stream of content. And, and there's a lot of reasons why um, people enjoy it. But subscriptions succeeded because of the customer experience benefits that they brought. And it's very difficult to both for that and for revenue reasons to see subscriptions going away. But it, it's very clear that you know, there's something, uh, 400 OTT services in the US, people have three or four subscriptions. You don't really need to be a, a data scientist to figure out there's going to be some sort of a problem there. I think one third of SVOD signups uh, so far this year have been to add supported models. So it's clear that there is a trend, absolutely. And I think that that's what we're likely to see is companies trying to figure out which of these boxes that they truly fit into. And, and that's something that's going to take a bit of time. OK. Um, I, I, I do think it's all about choice, consumer choice. I, I agree with you, Martin. Um, and, and consumers have a lot of choices. I think fast adds to that. Um, I think it also brings with it a lot of challenges. And, and those are real, real challenges. I don't know how many fast programs folks here have actually watched. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's different than linear TV, so right? Let's ask a question. Who has ever used a fast channel? Hands up. Consciously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so maybe a third. Yeah, so, so you're, making, you're making that choice. Um, and, and it's a great choice, right, if that fits the, the way you want to consume content at the time you want to consume it. Uh, but also your expectation is that it works really well. Uh, right and and the transitions from main content to ads back to main content those are smooth um, and and I think that those are the kinds of challenges I'm talking about um, they're real challenges there's still challenges that are being solved out there in the wild uh, so while fast is here uh, is it here to stay yeah probably I think it'll be around um, and and uh, as another choice but it's only going to stay and people will only stay to watch fast and continue to make that choice if it's a good quality uh, experience. Yeah. So you put on your slide, we move from subscription to hybrid models. Mm -hmm. So I'd see fast is uh, an element in your monetization mix. So maybe let's talk about that. How do you see the monetization mix evolve in the future or in the coming years? So there's fast, there's subscription. What is hybrid, Damien? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I don't think it's that new is the thing. I, I mean, we've had companies working with us uh, five years ago who were essentially running a, a hybrid model. Um, it, 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 it combines a couple of factors. I think 
What Igor said is exactly right. There are going to be challenges, not just on a technical level, but on a customer experience level. So how do you manage that there's now different levels of access, there's different levels of entitlement that people have, some content they can watch and not watch. That customer education, a burden that it adds is significant. But on the monetization side, the challenge is much more in terms of figuring out how you're going to forecast revenue around content. Because now you're not just trying to forecast around subscription revenues, but you're trying to add the naturally volatile advertising revenue dimension into it as well. And that's going to be, that's difficult, that's not an easy thing to get right first time. I think ultimately, and Martin I think has made a great point on this, is that it's how much can you remove the friction between these different levels? How, how adaptable can you be and how, how easily can you allow customers to self-segment? We would always talk a lot about segmentation, but customer-driven self-segmentation, how you facilitate that, that's the key to making this work. Okay. And do you see big differences between telcos, broadcasters, ASVOD players in their mix? Yeah, I think for what we see, and we, we work a lot with operators, and I think there we see a, a few different developments. They have a lot of great content, but also looking at ways how to uh, compete with other, other services. And what we believe, they have the biggest amount of new inventory coming in every day because they process a lot of live content, live broadcast content. And we believe there are still a lot of hidden gems in there, but, but cannot really be used, utilized well for catch-up replay viewing because the metadata is not there, yep. what, I saw, what I presented in the presentation. So that's one angle where they can do more. What we also see is that with all the fast developments, some of the operators now uh, see that they can actually, by removing ad breaks that are part of broadcast, they can um, uh, earn additional revenue. So, so one of our customers is looking at an add-on package for catch-up replay, replay where people are allowed to skip the ads, mm -hmm. which brings in a monetization opportunity for the operator. Part of that money will go back to the broadcaster, but of course it's their content. But on, the, on a third level, the viewers that, get, that use that option uh, 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 give the service a higher MPS score. So actually, they are happier with the service, they are willing to pay for it. So for them, it's an ideal outcome. They were frustrated, there's a solution. Maybe for other people, they don't care or they do not want to pay the premium. For them, that's fine that they keep it as it is. So for them, that's the hybrid, uh, what they can offer. Okay, so we'll have various models of how to make money. Maybe not as much as in the past, it's getting tougher to extract that money. Now you have the subscribers on board. Let's talk about churn, right? What are the main drivers of churn from your perspective? And maybe Igor, you go first. Why do customers leave? Yeah, uh, I mean, right now customers are leaving because of cost, right? Uh, services cost money. I think we're seeing a lot of um, uh, video streaming services introduce ad-supported models where maybe subscription was the only option. Um, we're also seeing transactional models increase. Uh, it seems like you know pay-per-view is sort of back again. Rentals uh, and and buying entire titles uh, uh, through uh, you know payment gateways. Um, so we're we're seeing that uh, more and more frequently uh, to to manage uh, costs. We're also seeing and and maybe Damien can talk about this a little bit more, but. Um, we have video streaming services who want to offer or who are offering uh, uh, gift cards and incentives and free trials uh, in more creative ways to uh, uh, sort of keep users on board. Um, uh, some of our customers who are using our quality of experience telemetry, they're using that to signal subscribers who uh, maybe they're not hearing from them directly, but they think because they're uh, uh, often running into technical problems with the service, they're more likely to go away or go away at sometime in the future. And so they're proactively reaching out to them with incentives to keep them around while they resolve those technical problems. Um, so I think there, there's uh, you know, more creative ways to, uh, uh, again, uh, proactively engage subscribers who maybe uh, are in danger of uh, going away. So maybe recommendations for operators, right? You, you find out the customer churn, why did they leave? Fantastic, you know it, but you wanna leave it, you wanna know it before they leave. It's always much harder, right, to, because that person's already made that decision. It's much harder to convince them to come back uh, than, than to proactively give them reasons to stick around, to, to, to doubt the potential decision that they might go away. Yeah. Damien, you, you mentioned your wheel. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, the cling wheel. Yeah, uh, for for me, it's very much it's a perspective thing. We always say that uh, churn is the most important problem that doesn't have a single owner in any of the organizations that we work with. Because um, if I talk to Igor, Igor will will explain uh, with great expertise how the streaming quality is going to be the key factor to retaining customers better. If I talk to Martin, he's going to explain about how it's the recommendations and how it's the UX of the applications and these small tweaks you can make are going to drive better NPS and going to keep people for longer. If you talk to me, I'll talk about how your pricing strategies and your onboarding strategies and what sort of incentives you put in place are going to keep the customers for longer. None of us are wrong, but none of us are right either. And that's the issue, is that you really need to have this very rounded perspective if you want to capture this true understanding of what's happening. For me, I think what's absolutely crucial is, are you understanding these drivers in a descriptive way? That's the, the foundation. But then are you benchmarking against what does it look like for another OTT service? Not what does it look like for a mobile phone company or some other type of subscription business, but against other OTT providers, your subscriber subscri subscriber management system should be telling you, is price a big problem for you? All of these problems in isolation look very big, but you really need to sit them next to each other and really understand what is it for us is really the thing that we should start with. And that requires unified data, uh, and that requires uh, a bit of patience as well. So assuming the data is there, mm -hmm. there are tools that can measure them. But I hear you say the problem is maybe the organization of the operator, because they should have a chief churn officer or a chief retention officer, but that most of them does not exist. I don't think anyone wants the job of chief churn officer. <laughs> it's probably one of the ones that you don't want to touch. Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, in the end, you have to get beyond uh, the human decision making of it. I mean, look, organizations have a DNA. They're going to lean in certain directions very naturally, and, and it, you should never push against that. I mean, for us, it really is where machine learning starts to step in and fill the gap. As you start to take a little bit of the, the deep analysis, the immersing yourself in data out of it, and you start to build learning engines that are really going to identify the people who are at risk and give you that reason why. We've been doing this for about three or four years. It took us about four years to get to, we were up to around 92% accuracy was what we were achieving with it. Uh, and a year on, I think we achieved another 2% of accuracy. So, you know, it, it takes a bit of work. But I think um, the key is this holistic view. And if, it, if uh, you can get learning models to do that work for you, I think that will make it a lot easier. It takes the organization bias out a little bit because it's there for sure. Martin. How, what would you suggest operators to do? What's the best way to fight churn and increase retention? Yeah, I, think, uh, I think I already made it clear with my presentation. It's about, in the end, the user experience that we think is really important. Because you have content, you might not have all the content. Uh, like you can, might not be able to have all the premium assets that maybe another platform will have or sports. But if the content you have, that cannot be consumed in a proper way. For us, that, that, that the points to that users become frustrated, and then it combined to what Igor said about people are looking at costs and more, then it's more like, why am I sp still paying this while I also have this and this service? And hey, what I actually expect here, I can get over there. And I think that's important to look at uh, yeah, what is the experience and really look at the data itself. I think also like, we are looking at user experience, making it better, but if streaming doesn't work, so if you don't have streaming solution, it doesn't matter because if people cannot play content, the rest doesn't matter at all. So you really need to look at the data, but also make sure, yeah, keep your viewers satisfied because they have a lot to choose from. There are so much uh, great services out there. Make sure you offer a better experience than the other ones. Yeah, Igor, you wanted yeah, to add? Yeah, I just I wanted to to highlight. So so I think uh, taking a well-rounded look at the business uh, of the streaming service of course is a good idea from the context of churn management, right? What are the triggers? And then to your point, data. Um, you know, everyone has lots of data. I think one of the biggest challenges um, and, and what I don't see happening often enough is federation and correlation of different disparate data sources, right? We talked about fragmentation of services. There's a lot of fragmentation of data. So you get, you know, certain data from this tool and certain data from this tool and that tool, and independently of one another, they might tell you bits and parts of the story, but if, um, I, I think investing into a strategy that uh, pulls that data together, that associates relevant uh, uh, data elements and, and um, really helps you to tell the full story, that's hard work, mm -hmm. uh, right, both sort of technically, but even more importantly from a business perspective, you have to invest the time in thinking about how do these da dif different data sources relate, 
Um, but once you figure that out, then you can really put the AI models to work and um, you can start making well-rounded decisions uh, about the business. Is that that easy? Once we have the data, we have the tools to analyze the data, then we are safe. I'm thinking about some alpha wolves in the organization said, I have the gut feeling, I've done that, I know how, leave me alone with your data, I know better. How much convincing does it need to really make a change? It is always a combination of art and science. I think that we have to say that to start with, and you're never going to completely remove those uh, artistic instincts from certain people in the organization, like you say. I mean, the, the conviction is going to come from the results, and I think Igor is exactly right. I mean, what we really try to think about when we talk to people, it's do you have actionable data? Action is really the key thing. Uh, of course, you can generate lots of data, and Igor is right, the, the work of consolidating that data is difficult work, but it's all about do you build milestones within your business uh, for the customers to move through the journey that you really are focused on. Does everybody in your organization know what's your conversion rate of people who are free users to people who buy a subscription, for example? Does everybody in your organization know what your trial conversion rate looks like? These types of metrics, once you kind of democratize them a bit, you make people think about these metrics more it starts to you know, seep into people's minds a little bit. And, and yes, of course, look, you can't be just blind to the data and say, well, the data says this and it doesn't really matter what your 40 years of experience says. I think that's a bad move in any domain of life. But I think it's more about how do you build that culture? And that culture is really what's going to drive the engagement with the data and not arguments. Uh, I've learned from hard experience, arguments don't work in that domain. <laughs> Uh, to, maybe to add to this, I think sure. also what, what, what helps a lot, because we also do a lot with artificial intelligence, that people have a certain view on it, whether it's perfect or they're afraid of it. And I think the best what we see, show what you can do with it, show real example, educate, and that also helps that people say, yeah, but I want 100%. And we say, yeah, we can get corrections to 95 uh, 95%, and then they say, yeah, but it might not be good enough. And then I point to the data, what I currently have, it's 6% correct. It's like, <laughs> what? what Try to see what you, what you can bring, and if that's already beneficial, maybe you already have a lot to, to gain. But if, if thing in these, you cannot just say it's just data. You need to look at, together with it. What can we do? What tools make sense? And see that it brings benefits, because it's not just about data, but also it's, it's rating on it. And then see, hey, by, by doing this, this works, this might not work. Fine, learn from it and iterate. It's not like data is the, is the whole solution. Okay. So we have all the data, we have the right tools, the AI tools. So how important will be personalization? So could I imagine that I get, let's say the four of us churn, the same service. Will I get a different retention offer than you, than you, than you? We're almost in the same age group, we watch the same thing, and still your behavior is different from yours and mine. So will I get to the point to super personalized micro retention offers? Are we there? Are we getting there? No, I, I don't think we're there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see it. Um, as a consumer, I, my customers don't talk about it that way. Um, no, I don't think we're, we're there at all. I think it, it would be wonderful, right, to have insights about individual persons to pro provide that kind of personalized uh, offer or, I mean, you know, media distillery focuses on personalization. Uh, those are some of the proactive things, but I don't think that exists today. I've not seen it. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I, I mean, I think the personalization, yes, but I think that level of granularity is just so far beyond where most companies are. I mean, if you're at the point of it, like Martin says, that uh, if you're at 99.99% and you're looking for that last 0.01%, then sure, maybe, but it's really so far beyond what a lot of companies are already doing. I think you can start so much simpler than that. Yes, you have to segment. Yes, you have to understand what does the ideal customer look like. You have to understand what are the engagement patterns that lead to longer term uh, commitment, to lifetime value growth. But I think this level of absolute micro-targeting, I think uh, that's for Twitter, that's for the guys who uh, make those very long blog posts and that type of thing. I mean, I think it's uh, personalization, yes, you, but you don't need to be that granular. You don't need to put yourself through that type of pain. There's a lot of success you can have by just being disciplined and repetitive and trying simple things like Martin says, experiment. I mean, we see companies that can get to 35, 40% win back rates just by being consistent. 
start by being consistent, and with consistency, we'll bring you a long way. And then, okay, then think about perfection. Good. Let's do full circle back to fast channels. Uh, so, no subscription revenue, people churn. Often when what has happened, I churn, I get a nice retention offer. Oh, you get five euros off, fantastic. What do I do if I don't pay nothing? So, what is the retention offer? Who wants to Martin take it? and me? Yeah, <laughs> Damien. We, we, can start. we can come to your house and shout at you, or maybe, maybe that's the, the strategy. I mean, uh, it, it depends on what do you really want to achieve from this, right? So, I mean, uh, at a certain point, okay, maybe there are customers who are just not for you. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that, but that's sometimes the case. I think that on a product level, uh, you think about things like uh, the reverse free trials is something people will talk about at the moment, is that you let people have that more premium access to the product for a certain period of time, and even doing that on a retention basis, it's a totally valid strategy. You, there isn't any loss of value there. You're letting people see what's there. And if you're still not getting engagement, fine. But but most likely, that's how you're going to recover more people. And I honestly think it's a, it's also about targeting it. It's not about just being blanket and, and hitting everybody and say, hey, come back, try everything for free for 30 days. Focus on groups that already have proven that they have some sort of interest and that they've qualified themselves somehow. Let them have a little bit more premium access to the platform, an ad-free experience, maybe some exclusives. And again, like Martin says, experiments, and that can often be the, the key. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. I want to give each of you the chance at famous last words. What should the audience take away? How to manage churn and retention and Igor, can you go first? Uh, don't underestimate quality of experience uh, at every step of the way. I think, you know, if you, if, if it, seems uh, like, oh, that might be a little complicated. I'm not really sure if someone's going to care. They care. They definitely care. Damien. Trust your instincts, but not too much. Uh, that's, that would be how we would often say it. Um, no, I, I think uh, what the guys have said uh, is a lot of very valid points. I think personalization matters. Uh, I think being proactive with, with your data, that matters. Um, but I think it's, it's very much about have achievable aims. I think you want to build momentum when you want to tackle something like churn. You don't treat it like this mountain you have to climb in one day. Build achievable aims, have good data that's going to make it clear what your efforts are actually achieving, and build momentum and build belief within the organization that you can do it. It's not something that you have to take for granted. It's something that you can tackle, and it's something that you can make progress with. And so step by step, that's what we see works best for our clients. Thank you, Damon. And Martin? Yeah, I think so. You need to look at, from our perspective, you need to look at what the, what the viewers want and who your viewers are, because there's not one singular viewer. You have all the age groups, different needs, different times. People want different th things at different times. I think that's an important part. And the second part, set clear goals for your organization. But right? what do you want to accomplish? Is this higher engagement? Is it more viewing? Is it advertising related, be sure what you want to achieve and then look at what of your uh, products or what of your user experience contributes to that. Where's the biggest gain to be made? And I see that it's not always that, 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 that the TV services have a clear view on what they would like to achieve. So it starts with it. But what, what, where do you want to be one year from now? Set that uh, signpost and then see how you can get there. Yeah. So one of my takeaways is don't wait until churn happens and then you try to throw retention at it. You need to be proactive, you need the right data, you need the right organization, you need the breadth and the depth to do it. And you guys should probably talk to all of these three guys because they're quite complementary, as I understand, tackling different areas of the problems. You love problems. I'm sure you have a lot to fix. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And big applause for the three speakers.